Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Commodity TV and the new edition of our online interview presentation. Today we have here Osisco Metals, and with us is Robert Ware. Say welcome and good morning to Canada. How are you? Very good. Yourself, Jürgen. Perfect. Thank you very much. All fine. And uh, we were just talking already about zinc and uh, new zinc batteries. And I found it really interesting, uh, those uh, technologies which are really evolving. And I would say Osisco Metals is yeah, really a place or let's say a, a company and a share to be in the zinc uh, universe and really important. And you guys did a great job so far. You brought us a presentation with you and we want to talk about your terrific company. I will bring that up now and i would say robert mm -hmm. the floor is yours okay thank you very much and uh, welcome everyone hope everyone has had a, a fine summer as we pull into uh, the fall season uh just quick update uh, drilling has restarted at pine point uh, we have thirteen thousand meters uh, slated between now and christmas so uh, very active uh, we do have covid restrictions only two drills allowed but uh, that will be sufficient to uh, complete our program uh, so if, just a few words about general markets, uh, commodities, markets, base metals have done very well so far this year and have uh, literally exceeded all uh, banking analysts' expectations. And that is largely due to demand quickly growing, uh, EV sales uh, being higher than expected, and generally uh, the slow, I should say still a slow change, but improving uh, in terms of pace, uh, to the EV market and uh, decarbonizing our economy is, is proceeding uh, very healthily. And of course, uh, the direct impact is that this is having um, an impact on base metal demands, uh, nominally copper, uh, nickel, and zinc uh, and cobalt. And just a few quotes here that you're seeing. Uh, some of the uh, metal analysts and the commodities analysts are trying to change their tune and seeing that uh the increasing base metal demand is here to stay one of my favorites from jeff curry who's global head of commodities at goldman sachs last december and he's still so he's calling it the revenge of the old economy obviously old economy is commodities new economy is is cryptos and uh, fintech and so on but he's still seeing uh, a huge disconnection between uh, commodity prices and equities in the uh, commodity sector, and it's very true. It's very true. Price earning ratios are very low uh, for uh, base metal producing companies. Uh, still relatively little interest in developers. Um, and of course, in my opinion, a lot of the new economy stocks are ridiculously overpriced, but uh, I do believe that is going to change. And the need is going to lead that change. We need those metals in order to uh, convert our economy and get away from our dependence on, uh, on fossil fuels. And you know what, Robert? What is really funny with that, with, without the old economy and mining, you would not have created one Bitcoin. Uh, well, that's true because Bitcoins consume... <laughs> A lot of Our? computer powers, and there's exactly. a lot of copper and other metals in those computers. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Not to mention the electricity generated uh, required to, to create those cryptocurrencies. Mm -hmm. So just a quick look at uh, zinc and lead. Again, the, these are the quiet, relatively quiet, unspoken metals. Uh, spot price of zinc has done exceptionally well since the beginning of uh, 2021. Analyst expectations have had the uh, spot price of zinc sitting at about a dollar ten average this year. Uh, it's trading between a dollar dollar thirty five very healthily, and there's absolutely no reason for this to drop off. Again, demand is strong, especially from China, and uh, production is simply not increasing. And it's not because mines are currently operating at capacity, and there are no new mines coming into production. Lead's a very common byproduct of zinc mines, and nobody's talking about lead, but look what's happened. Lead has moved from 80 cents at the end of the, uh, 2020, currently trading at $1.10 US a pound. So fantastic performance even from lead, and yet nobody talks about it. Mm -hmm. So for those analysts who do focus on commodities, base metal commodities now, they're of course entirely focused on copper, 
Copper has always been the leader in the base metal space. Copper has also done very well, trading right now about $4.25 US per pound. Uh, again, the demand for copper is uh, quite strong, and because of electrification of our economy, the pressure on copper production uh, is going to incre keep increasing significantly. In my opinion, I can easily see by year end uh, $1.50 zinc and $5 copper. I would not be surprised at all, at all, uh, because uh, this is an inevitable trend that's set into motion now, and it will not change. So, and these improvements are here to stay. So, looking forward to the next couple of years, but more importantly, in the next decade, this what will underpin zinc demand is, like copper and nickel, it's an essential commodity for decarbonation of the economy. Zinc, however, being used mostly uh, for uh, galvanization and rust proofing all the infrastructure, the new infrastructure is going to be needed for this, and also uh, transportation. It's very nice to have electric vehicles, but no one's going to want to drive a rusty electric vehicles, especially not in uh, northern communities. So all that's going to require, again, galvanized steel. Uh, but the potential of new avenues, one technology that we're very excited about is uh, zinc hybrid flow batteries as a means for storing grid energy. So as you know, wind and, and um, solar power, these uh, renewable technologies are fundamentally not cost efficient unless you can store the energy. So uh, new technologies in order to allow this, and now we're talking about grid storage, uh, not small scale batteries that go either in your, uh, in your uh, smartphone or even a vehicle. We're talking uh, megawatts of storage. And there are two technologies that have entered the market in the last uh, year and a half. One's called Zinc 8. It's a Canadian startup. The equivalent in the US is called EOS Power Systems. Both use the same technology and they're called zinc hybrid flow batteries. And uh, they're container size units that can uh, contain, produce about 10 megawatts of power each. So uh, you'd, uh, for example, to produce 100 megawatts, you'd have to uh, you know, hook up 10 of those in series. And uh, the advantage of using zinc over large scale lithium uh, batteries is that it's cheaper. Secondly, uh, large lithium batteries do have one risk uh, in case of overheating and using uh, flammable solvents. So there is a fire hazard in case of uh, lithium ion batteries for grid storage. And finally, um, it is very likely that available lithium supply globally is going to be entirely consumed by the transportation industry. And so that will leave very little for grid storage. Question, so the Robert, biggest... question, Robert. Could yeah. we use then those containers, for example, in a cellar of a skyscraper? Because I think that would be a real breakthrough. Because uh, I, I, as far as I know, there are solar, um, how can I say that, uh, solar surfaces which you can put on windows so that you can, like during the day, you can load mm -hmm. from the skyscraper window, but then you store it in yeah. the night in the cellar. Would this something like, uh, would this work? Well, actually, it's right? happening. Uh... Yes, it's happening as we speak. Uh, Zinc 8 obtained this year a contract with a uh, New York City Power Authority. Uh, they're testing uh, their technology in a few in the basements with a few skyscrapers. Uh, the motivation is largely economic. In a place like uh, downtown Manhattan, uh, peak electricity is twice the cost of nighttime electricity. Okay. So the idea is, uh, and this is... Uh, uh, the initiative from the owners of the skyscrapers. Uh, the initiative is to store energy at night and redeploy it uh, at peak hours uh, to the offices. Mm -hmm. uh, and that will significantly cut down on electrical uh, consumption costs uh, for the skyscrapers. And Zinc 8 obtained uh, their technology was approved by the uh, New York City Power Authority, again, because of safety concerns of uh large-scale lithium-ion batteries the fire hazard associated with the uh, mm -hmm. lithium-ion batteries yeah. so there's no doubt that the zinc hybrid flow batteries are, are uh, well they're cheaper and they're safer 
Do you have and, an uh, idea how much zinc is required in those batteries regarding the power they have or the, the power storage they have? Do you, uh, do no, you know that's, that? That's, that's a good question. I could get back to you. It's mm -hmm. probably not enormous because the technology involves actually, it's a chemical battery essentially. Mm -hmm. So what you do, you have a, uh, this is how it works. Uh, the battery system is split into three units called the zinc regenerator, the storage tank, and the power stack. So your outside power supply, um, essentially you have a zinc oxide suspension in a neutral solvent, and your outside power supply reduces that to zinc metal. That is uh, the same suspension. So we're talking <coughs> a micro particulate zinc metal in suspension. Mm -hmm. And when you, uh, you want to de redeploy that power, uh, this zinc metal is re-oxidized using air back into zinc oxide, and the energy is uh, released uh, to uh, to your power requirement. So then you end up with the same suspension with zinc oxide, which is brought back into the zinc regenerator. Mm -hmm. So it's essentially, uh, because it uses a neutral solvent suspension, it can be stored almost indefinitely uh, without any degradation. Uh, as opposed to, and that's one big advantage over the competing technologies. Mm -hmm. And the size of power generators is fundamentally uh, related to the size of your storage facility and how much uh, the size of your tank, essentially. So it's a closed system. It's environmentally uh, safe, and um, it's relatively cheap compared to either lithium or vanadium redox. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, and they're extremely efficient, <laughs> which is, as you pointed out, makes them very attractive for uh, power storage, even on a smaller scale within uh, uh, within uh, business towers, for example, in downtown areas. But the, the real future of this, I believe, is for uh, grid storage, large, much larger scale grid storage for wind farms and uh, solar farms both in uh, North America and uh, Europe. It's very nice uh, to redo, to use these renewable sources of energy, but as you know, they only generate electricity when the sun shine or the wind blows, but your demand, of course, does not follow the sun or the wind. The demand is really focused on uh, peak hours in the morning and evening. So again, to make these systems cost efficient, you really have to be able to store or uh, the electricity uh, you generate uh -huh. into large-scale uh, grid power system. So I think this is a very exciting technology. Uh, back to Pine Point, in an area like northern Canada, where uh, grid uh, energy is limited. In the case of Pine Point, we most of our energy, about 70% uh, in our PEA plan, was to be supplied by the Tolston Power Dam. Uh -huh. The rest of it uh, from uh, was going to be supplied from uh, liquid natural gas (LNG). So obviously, it's uh, in everyone's interest to uh, have an operation that has a reduced uh, carbon footprint. Mm -hmm. And so we're ex uh, we've initiated a trade-off study this year to look at the viability of setting up a wind farm at Pine Point. It's in the Northern Territories. Obviously, it's windy, but the question is. Is it windy enough to be cost efficient? And that is what we're going to establish with this trade-off study. We're going to establish the size of wind farm required to generate the energy to uh, see how much of that liquid natural gas uh, generation can be replaced. And then uh, we would very much like to test uh, the Zinc 8 technology grid storage system on site, coupling it with the wind farm in order to establish uh, uh, the you know, or improve the cost efficiency uh, of the system. Mm, fantastic. So that uh, trade-off study should be uh, completed by year end or at least uh, early Q1. If it's viable, it will be incorporated into our updated PEA study, which is scheduled for release at the end of the first quarter 2022. And uh, if we're successful, it's going to be a big plus. Uh, because we're going to uh, be able to reduce our carbon footprint significantly for the Pine Point mining operation. Mm -hmm. It would also be the first mine uh, in Northern Canada 
that uh, would couple wind uh, wind farm to a zinc eight uh, or zinc hi uh, hybrid flow battery storage. So it'll be a first for uh, certainly. In fact, it'll be a first for North America. Mm -hmm. I like the idea of having a zinc mine that is uh, powers uh, or stores its energy using zinc batteries. It's uh, it's quite appropriate, I think. Yeah, so that and, would be like you can deliver your own zinc into your battery. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. I love that. I saw also in your press release you are thinking on geothermal energy. I mean, that's also something which is really green, right? Yes, uh, we have a very large lake right beside us mm -hmm. that is a source of geothermal energy. Uh, that's an entirely different proposal. Uh, um, we have no idea how much energy power we could generate, but obviously in the wintertime, Great Slave Lake does not freeze. So if you send enough pipes into Great Slave Lake, you could tap. Uh, it's, uh, I would call it more um, hydrothermal energy, actually, mm -hmm. because the uh, the uh, the pipes would not be going underground; they'd be going straight down into uh, the lake. Okay. So it's a very large body of water, which, even in winter time, it's only uh, five degrees centigrade. It does contain a significant amount of energy, and so using geothermal uh, energy uh, trade-offs principles, uh, we should be able to possibly could tap that energy. But I think that's a longer shot. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think wind power is is more likely uh, to be a, a suitable alternative uh, up at uh, Pine Point. So uh, just back to zinc again uh, for demand. Again, we are forecasting a supply deficit. This was published recently. A new study by Wood McKenzie but forecasted uh, supply gaps using uh, the latest statistics. And uh, this chart essentially shows proportion of uncommitted 2030 metal supply needed to meet uh, market requirements in a uh, decarbonizing economy and also an economy that is rebuilding its uh, infrastructure. Again, uh, the Biden $2 trillion uh, infrastructure um, bill as passed through the Senate is going back to Congress and we expect final approval uh, probably uh, in early fall. So uh, this is very positive news for zinc. And uh, tied into the Wood McKenzie study, uh, they are foreseeing, uh, again, when they say proportion of uncommitted 2030, that is essentially the size of the uh, gap that they're seeing in the supply side for the market. So interestingly enough, uh, zinc, copper, and lead are the three leaders in terms of uh, metal supply deficits that are looming between now and uh, 2030. The only metals that uh, do not appear and uh, will not be on the deficit side are essentially uh, chromium in the form of chromium steel and uh, essentially iron ore. So, and aluminum is about neutral. But if we look at uh, met coal and all the other uh, base metals, we're all looking at uh, supply deficits. And 2030 is an interesting date because the EU and a few uh, North American uh, provinces and states have already declared uh, shutting down sales of conventional uh, internal combustion engine vehicles by 2030 or 2035. This is extremely ambitious uh, because because it's pushing the electric vehicle agenda uh, uh, very hard. And uh, I do not think that the global mining industry will be able to respond in time to meet those objectives in terms of supplying the metals needed. So we're going to hit a wall, I think, globally. Um, it's obviously desirable to electrify our economy and reduce the carbon footprint to put a stop to global warming. Mm -hmm. But the reality is, is that metal supply simply is not there. And uh, a lot of the money uh, has to be invested in order to uh, bring that uh, to where it needs to be. And we're talking uh, billions in investment here in the form of the new mines. So back to point point, uh, just a few closing words. Uh, uh, well, we maintain that this is uh, the leading North American zinc development project, but we decided simply Summarize it in one simple Venn diagram. If you combine critical mass of resource plus 20 million tons of resource, uh, existing infrastructure, 
and premium uh, quality concentrate, if you look at those three elements, all of which are essential in order to uh, build a mine, Pine Point is the only project in North America that meets those three criteria. Absolutely the only one. So this is why we believe it's, it's a project. If you look at the, uh, the development projects globally using those three criteria, uh, there's only a handful, literally a handful of projects globally. So this is one of the reasons why we believe zinc is particularly exposed to supply deficits. Most of the projects on the table right now uh, have, uh, are complicated or have weaknesses simply on the basis of these uh, three elements. And any investment, uh, any investor who is considering investing in base metals and particularly zinc should pay uh, particular attention to these three uh, parameters in terms of deciding whether the project is viable or not. Yeah, and, and I think also your, your project could be just on the right time then in production, right? When it's yes. really hitting the deficit hard. Yes, it will be. As I said, uh, more mine closures are coming in between now and 2024, and that's going to hit the market very hard. Uh, as I pointed out uh, in my previous presentations, we're looking at a 35% drop in North American zinc production between now and 2024. And right now, there's absolutely nothing in the pipeline uh, to compensate for that. So North American smelters will be forced uh, to import uh, more zinc concentrates in order to meet North American demand. And I do believe that uh, the Biden infrastructure bill will create substantial demand. Uh, when we're talking about basic rebuilding here of, of roads, of bridges, of rail lines, a lot of that material requires galvanized steel. So uh, I think the future of steel is very bright. Uh, so iron mine and investment in iron mines is also very good over the long term and uh, ditto for zinc. Uh, but again, uh, even if Pine Point comes into production on time, it certainly won't be enough. Uh, we would need, I believe, five to 10 Pine Points in North America to make up for the, uh, the supply uh, deficit that is coming. Okay. So uh, to close up on what we're doing, uh, finishing up uh, this fall period into Christmas period, and uh, so far in 2021, Last winter, we completed a resource definition program in the West Zone. We relocated more historical drill holes. This data will be incorporated into the updated mineral resource estimate for the PEA in uh, Q1 2022. We're currently going on, uh, still carrying on a relogging of our historical uh, drill holes that are on site. And the current drill program, 13,000 meters. <coughs> excuse me, includes uh, multi-purpose holes, which serve for both hydrogeological test work and resource definition. And again, uh, we do, uh, we are carrying on with our hydrogeology initial results. Uh, press release to begin of summer clearly indicate that the uh, classic model of point point in which uh, water infiltration was controlled by uh, formations, geological formations is wrong. Uh, there are no porous formations in, in the Pine Point uh, camp uh, that carry water. Uh, all indications so far indicate that water input is through discrete faults, uh, which as, uh, as far as an individual deposit is concerned may or may not be there. So that goes a long way to explaining why some pits today uh, from the old mining operation are still dry and others are flooded. The water influx is from faults. So the good news is uh, sealing a fault and grouting a fault and pumping water uh, to reduce uh, flow within the fault is much, much cheaper and easier than uh, trying to seal off an entire formational aquifer. So we expect uh, once this model has been perfected that our OPEX and sustaining CAPEX costs will be very substantial uh, for the mining operation. Um, our community relations are in good shape. Uh, we're seeking support for advanced exploration permit to uh, increase our property. Uh, we do have drill targets, which I find very exciting, just outside our current property right now, which we cannot drill. Uh, we hope to have a new permit by year end so we can drill that off next winter. 
and go back to doing a more basic uh, exploration. But the fall drill program is focused on uh, resource definition, uh, conversion from uh, inferred to indicated, and also expansion around those uh, known mineralized uh, zones. So that is uh, essentially what's going to happen between, again, between now and the Christmas time. So, uh, so Robert, yes, very. Robert, again, when, when when can we expect first results from those thirteen thousand meters? What do you oh, think? Uh, I would say within the next uh, two weeks. Oh wow, yeah, the, that's fast. Yeah, the samples are in the lab, and the data is coming in. So okay, super. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that wraps it up. Basically, a 13,000 meter drill program. So a lot of uh, news flow and, and uh, drilling results for you on Christmas. Mm -hmm. uh, our trade off study to reduce greenhouse gas uh, emissions uh, hopefully will be successful. We can replace some of our LNG power generation by uh, wind power and grid storage energy, again, using uh, zinc hybrid flow uh, systems. And uh, again, I will uh, emphasize that Pine Point has the potential to become a leading supplier of very high purity zinc and lead concentrates, clean concentrates, no deleterious elements. And this will be a great value to, uh, to any smelter uh, on the planet. But of course, we will, uh, as a first pass, we hope to be able to deploy that concentrate to uh, North American uh, smelters. Mm -hmm. Super. And uh, again, uh, I'm very much looking forward to our updated PEA and mineral resource estimate to be published by the end of Q1 yeah. 2022. So the project is on budget, is on time. Uh, we will keep developing this exceptional asset. And uh, I do believe this will become uh, North America's next zinc mine. Absolutely. So but it really looks like that. And I mean, you are, anyhow have a very strong team. You are inside a very strong organization with Osisco, of course. Yeah. And I think the financing opportunities are definitely there. Talking about finances, um, what is cash in the bank? So are you, yeah, let's say. Yeah, we're good till next January. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, obviously the share price there, there is lack of interest still in part of the markets uh, in the commodity space and particularly uh, nickel and zinc. Mm -hmm. uh, the development projects are not getting much attention. Mm -hmm. I hesitate to keep financing at 40, 50 cents. It's very dilutive. So for uh, carry on for further financing, we're actually discussing with uh, private groups and uh, with the possibility of maybe selling a 20% participation interest in, um, in Pine Point, rather than issue more shares, it would be far less dilutive. I want to point out that at, uh, at current uh, zinc and lead prices, actually, and I do not believe that these are optimistic spot prices. I think they're here to stay. Uh, the, uh, Pine Point NPV actually uh, is above 700 million Canadian from the 500 that we had in our PEA. Because mm -hmm. don't forget our PEA was done at a conservative prices of 95 cent lead mm -hmm. and a dollar 15 zinc. Mm -hmm. Now we're seeing a dollar 35 zinc and a dollar 10 lead. So, uh, and again, I'm very bullish on, on both metals. Mm -hmm. So uh, even if the, pro the project doesn't develop, uh, just the rising prices of commodities obviously significantly increases the value of the project. Mm -hmm. So I think at this point, the timing would uh, would be good to sell uh, participating interest in the project mm -hmm. with a friendly partner who will continue to contribute uh, their portion as we carry the project forward. And this is a uh, it's a good alternative to uh, it's a good alternative to issuing more cheap equity. Yeah, but that that would mean if you say if you sell twenty percent, for example, of the company as a participating interest, would that mean at a premium, hopefully, right? Yes, we would certainly hope for a premium. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay, super. So just remind us uh, to finish here off. Uh, what is let's say the game plan to be in production? Uh, again, the original game plan was to be shovel ready by the end of 2024, which mm. means uh, permit, uh, feasibility, and uh, IBA with uh, the First uh, First Nations groups and uh, Indigenous groups. Mm -hmm. So uh, that would mean then you proceed to mine financing and construction. Uh, that would take us through uh, 2025, so production 
would be realistic, let's say, by mid-2026 in such mm -hmm. a case. Super. That's exactly when the horrible deficit hits the market. <laughs> yes, that's when I hope to see Zinka do dollars a pound, actually. Absolutely. Yeah. Me too. <laughs> Super. Yeah. Robert, thank you very much. It was a great presentation, great update. Honestly, you convinced me. I, I got to buy more shares, definitely. Uh, that's uh, I am. really, really good talking to you. Thanks for that. And I find it also really interesting with that Zinc 8 uh, uh, energy yeah. thing, because that might be something which, which could really change the markets and i think uh, so and it, it addresses our esg profile of course very nicely so yeah, fantastic and the other advantage that one aspect that is really neglected by uh, mining companies is the uh, carbon carbon credit market mm -hmm. uh that's available also available wealth uh, to mining companies that reduce their carbon footprint fantastic so that's something we'll have uh, if our trade-off study is successful we'll see uh <laughs> we'll see what we can do with carbon credits mm -hmm. on that front. Super. Great. Robert, I wish you a wonderful day. Thank you very much for your time. And uh, yeah, look forward to hopefully see you soon someday here. Yes, and, I hope so. Uh, please uh, keep well and safe. And uh, we talk uh, quite soon, I have the feeling, because uh, when you start with all those drill results, we have to update uh, our viewers here. Absolutely. All right. Super. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Robert. Yeah, ladies right. and gentlemen, that was Robert Wares from Cisco Metals. And you heard it. Pine Point really trick, checks all the boxes. 13,000 meters are now uh, blend on. It's out in the world. I would definitely say Pine Point is amongst number one, number two here in the world, definitely. And with those climbing zinc and lead prices, it's even coming better and better every day. Thanks for watching us and bye-bye from Switzerland.